we've been talking about wisdom and what wisdom is and what wisdom is not. And our definition of wisdom that we're using, there, we, we, there may be more than one, but this is the one that we're using and the, the, what we mean by it when we say wisdom is the most appropriate and effective use of the knowledge of truth according to your situations. Uh, we all have situations and they all require choices. And we need to know that the truth that we're using in those situations is true and how to effectively apply it to that situation. And God is really wanting us to have that wisdom. And in fact, he said, he says in his word, if any of us lacks that wisdom, then what we need to do is ask for it, which is a pretty good deal on our part. And we talked about the difference between man's wisdom and um, um, God's wisdom and what some of the the differences were there. And I won't read through all those tonight, but I will get you to look down to where it says um, limited by humanity, unlimited in deity. Um, just past the halfway point there. Tainted by corruption is man's wisdom, but perfect in holiness is God's wisdom. Man's wisdom is submitted to self, and God's wisdom is submitted to God. Man's wisdom produces fruits of the flesh, and God's wisdom produces the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to see how that plays out tonight in the continuation of the story of Gideon, where we left off last week. And we're going to see what that fruit looks like, the, what the fruit of wisdom looks like. So, Gwen, if you would take us on to the next one. Um, where we started last week was in the first part of Judges chapter 7. And it tells us a story about Gideon after he has gotten rid of the um, altar to ba Baal and the statue to Baal. And he's told the people that they... Um, shouldn't be worshiping that and they come to realize that the fact that they the reason that they had been having such a hard time is because they were worshiping things other than God and then when um, they realize that an army comes and joins Gideon which is always a nice thing if you're having a hard day and like you know 20,000 people actually here I guess it was about 33,000 people show up at your house and like we're here to help that would be pretty cool, right? Um, and uh, that's what happens with Gideon. So he's got this army, um, and they're staring down the their enemies across the way, uh, across the valley. And but he's feeling good. He's had a small victory. He's looking for a bigger victory, and he's got a whole lot more people now to help him with that. So it says, and we read these last week. We're just going to uh, review real quickly this evening. It says, then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who are with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harad, so that the camp of the Midianites, that's the bad guys, was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. And God was hedging they're uh, hedging his glory um, by saying that, by removing these people because he knew otherwise they would give credit to themselves. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So you do some quick math there and you can tell they had 32,000. Now they're going to have 10,000. That's, that's a little less encouraging when you're staring down an army that's already bigger than you were to begin with. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. <clears throat> and the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. 
But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took their provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and then he sent all away, sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of, the, of Midian was below him in the valley, still with uh, tens of thousands of soldiers. So we, that is God's wisdom prevailing there because man's wisdom would have said we don't need less people we need more people god said you need less people so you'll trust more in me um, you need to have your numbers reduced so that you will understand that it's me that's winning this battle for you and not your own hand and so he gives gideon after that so that's god's wisdom coming through and what i want you to consider tonight are some of the fruits that come from that wisdom so the, this evening's message is particularly about the fruits of the of that wisdom and um remember when if you look down the bottom of our list here it says man's wisdom produces fruits of the flesh um god's wisdom produces the fruit of the spirit and we'll look more particularly about what those are next week but i want to give you an example of that this week and it's and it's in um Judges chapter seven, verses nine through twenty-five. So this, so we're, God's got Gideon's got his three hundred guys, but guess what? In some sense, that's still too many. Because look what happens here. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to get to him to Gideon, arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp of Pura, your servant. And to stop right there for a second, because the first fruit that we see that comes from God's wisdom is divine direction. In other words, Gideon is now, he is submitted to what God wants. He's, he is dependent upon God because he's got 300 against, um, we'll say 100,000. I'll have to look up the exact number for you. And he... In the face of all that, God says, okay, you got your 300, but I want you just to go down there by yourself. And Gideon probably it doesn't get say what Gideon says here, but I'm guessing he's probably like, uh, come on, God. Is this 300 low enough? And God says, I want you to go down there. But if you're afraid, Gideon's like, okay, here it comes. You can take the 300 with you. If you're afraid, you can take one guy. One guy that uh, will go with you. Your servant, Pura, Pura, or Pura, however you pronounce that. He says, so you could take him with you. And so the second thing that we see right away that is a fruit of Gideon's, a, a fruit of wisdom in Gideon's life is faithful fellowship or faithful friendship. And we see that with the fact that there was one guy other than Gideon, that God appointed to go down there. And one guy that God could trust, that he knew that Gideon would trust going down, going into that. It's interesting when you read um, the stories of people in the Bible. We, we pick them out, and it's always, you know, there's Abraham and Moses. You, know, you jump all the way to the other end of the spectrum, and there's Peter and Paul. And we think about these guys as being singular heroes, and they're not. They they always have somebody with them. Paul had Silas and Barnabas and others at different times. Uh, Peter had John Mark. Um, I'm sorry, not John Mark. He had Mark. Um, and um, Mo, who did Moses have? Anybody know? Does Moses have anybody? God told Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh. Moses said, I can't do that on my own. So God says, take Aaron, your brother, with you. Um, Abraham had Sarah and so on and so forth. All God rarely leaves his people completely on their own unless it's for some particular purpose. And so what I want us to take from this is that when God's, when we are yielding to God's wisdom, we're not ever going to be alone. We might feel alone. But if we listen and look just a little bit and, and are surrendered to what God wants us to do, he'll provide somebody to walk, walk with you. Also, you might be the person 
that somebody's looking for to walk with them. And it's important that we follow that through as well. Because sometimes somebody may come to you and say, listen, I'm going through something really hard um, and I need you to come with me. And you might be like, oh, well, I'll, how about I pray for you? That, that, and they might be like, that's great. You can pay or pray while you're standing right next to me while I'm dealing with this difficult person. Um, we need to be willing to do that. So God provides divine direction, faithful fellowship, and then he um, tells Gideon what's going to happen when they get down there. <clears throat> In verse 11, it says, You shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And then he went down with Pura his servant to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites, all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. So that not only did they have the infantry, but they had cavalry as well, or, or camel ravi, uh, as it were, um, to, to attack the Israelites. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that the so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. So let's stop right there before we look any farther because I don't want to want to give it away for you. But I'm not an interpreter of dreams. You probably aren't either. But if somebody came to you and had that dream, you'd probably be like, oh, we better go out at the most. You'd be like, maybe we should go out and check our tent post and make sure the tent is secure in case any barley loaves come rolling along and knock our tent over and we have to wake up in the middle of the night. That might be the most extreme thing you can have, you can imagine happening, or, or the most practical, extreme yet practical interpretation you can give to that dream. But what this guy interprets is amazing. So remember, these are the enemies; these are the bad guys. One's telling another that he's had a dream that a big loaf of bread comes into um, the camp and knocks their tent over. And okay, and his friend says this. In verse 14, then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And at this point, the other guys were, oh, 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 calm down, buddy. It was just a loaf of bread. I was just tent in a tent. But what's actually happening is God revealing to those two guys but not primarily for them what is going to happen. The primary people that he wanted to hear the interpretation of that message were the ones sitting outside of the tent, hidden in darkness. And so verse 15 says, And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. So not only do we get divine direction and faithful fellowship, but we get a proper perspective. God, through this entire his entire interaction with Gideon, had been trying to get him to see that. It's not about what Gideon could see. It's not about what the rest of them could see. It's about what the about the God that they couldn't see, but who they could absolutely trust in. And the same is true for you and me. We look at our situations in life. We look at our and we look at our bank accounts and we look at our um, our clothes and our cars and whatever else. And however we view those things, um, a lot of times affects how satisfied or content we are with life and when we look at those things and say they're good then we feel good when we look at those things and say they're they could be better then we feel like things could be better when we look at those things and say oh this is terrible then we think that uh, then our perspective on ourselves and our life life is terrible but what god wants us to do is to look at him in the sense of having a perspective that looks at every part of our life and says, 
um, this is where I am. This is what God, ha where God has me. This is what he has me doing. This is what he wants me. This is what he has me possessing right now. And I'm going, I want to serve, honor him with it, enjoy him in it and, and use it for his glory. He wants us to have that perspective and therefore be delivered from the perspective that we can just or that we have to live day by day, moment to moment, up and down based upon our situations and our possessions. He wants us to have proper perspective that, that he is the resource of all we need and all we need to do and all that we're facing. That's what he was trying to communicate, communicate to Gideon for the first time he introduced himself to Gideon. And Gideon doubted and he doubted and he doubted. And now he, but he obeyed and obeyed and he obeyed. And even though he's been obeying and he's done what God wanted him to do and he's down to 300 guys, he still has his doubts. And God says, I know you got your doubts. So take your buddy with you. Now they're down to two again, going into the, the camp. And it's, I think at this point, maybe that Gideon has a breakthrough moment and says, oh my goodness, it's not going to be us. It's not going to be even because it's not going to be because of how many we have or how many we don't have. It's going to be because what God has, and that's all the power in the universe. And so he says to he he says to the rest of the people, arise for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. And they are still sitting there in the same spot they were before, you understand. Um, they haven't had a battle. The Midianites have not retreated. They're still sitting there staring at them, waiting to chop them to bits. And yet, Gideon makes this present tense statement that arise for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. In other words, it's, it's yours for the taking. And I want you to understand that that is, that is the case with everything that every good and perfect thing that God wants to give you and to place into your life. It's as good as done. In fact, because in God's, from God's perspective, it is done. From our perspective, we, we, it looks like we've got mountains to climb and, you know, valleys to uh, forge. But from God's perspective, we're already there. You're already there. And that's true for each and every one of us, regardless of our situation. And it's true for us as a church, regardless of our situation. So this is what happens. Um, Verse 16, then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. Um, there is, there, there, I should say there are, there are probably thousands of books written on uh, strategies for war. I guarantee you that none of them include taking only a trumpet and a pitcher with a torch inside of it in the battle against a army that's like hundreds hundreds of times your size but that's what they do and it's interesting to note here well let me go ahead and read the rest of it and we'll see what 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 other fruits we need to pick up here And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. 
Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And stop right there just for one second. Because the fruit that we're seeing here as a result of God's wisdom in action is what I'm going to call uh, popular participation. In other words, yes, there were 300 people. And yes, they were selected by God. However, when Gideon tells them, this is what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to split everybody up. There's only 300 of them to begin with. And, you know, they always say, I know you hear the phrase divide and conquer, but they, they are highly advised against that in, in the military. And he says, we're going to divide you up. They're probably like, mm -mm. And he said, we're not going to take any weapons. We're just going to take a, these trumpets and, and torches and pitchers. And they're probably like, mm -mm -mm. But they all do it. They all follow through with this plan. As crazy as it sounds, because at this point in time, their faith is not what they have at hand. Their, what, no, their faith isn't in a trumpet. Their faith isn't in a pitcher. Their faith isn't in their swords because they're leaving those behind. Their faith is in God and what he can do. And this strategy, as crazy as it sounds, was actually pure genius. And I believe for a, a, a result of, again, of God's wisdom. Because typically what would happen if there was a night <laughs> attack like they were having here is that each company of soldiers would have, I'm sorry, not each company, I would say maybe each regiment, whatever a thousand <laughs> soldiers is, would have a torch out in front of them. They, they didn't want more light than that because they didn't necessarily want to um, attract too much attention, but they wanted everybody to see the torch so they knew where to, what to follow and where to go in the dark. So if you got 300 people and the Midianites know this tactic, they know that, a, that one torch represents a thousand soldiers, you know, is what a thousand soldiers follow. And they look up and they see all around them 300 torches and they hear these voices saying the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, how many soldiers do you think they're going to guesstimate are out there? I'll help you out. 300 times a thousand is, I think I'm doing this math right, but I've got people to correct me if I'm wrong. It's 300,000, correct? 300 times that. Thank you, um, teacher in the, in the balcony. Uh, <laughs> 300,000. So they don't think there's 300 people out there. They see 300 torches out there and they think each torch represents 1,000 people. There's 300,000 people, which is more than they have. And they go crazy. And so the, the fifth and last fruit of wisdom that we're going to see tonight is valiant victory. Every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. This is the army of the Midianites because they're, they're, going, they're going berserk. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabat. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. We're going to stop there tonight, but I want you to um, understand exactly what's happening here. These guys... Um, or probably some of them waking up, some of them going to bed, some of them on watch, and they see all these torches and they hear the noise of the trumpets and they think this represents not 300 men, but 300 regiments. And they freak out. And they, not, guides at this point in time, in, in the actual winning of the victory, Gideon's men don't have to lift a sword. All they have to do is light a torch and blow a trumpet. And all those guys start, in the Midianite camp, all the bad guys start killing each other because they are so terrified and, dis and discombobulated. And once they realize that they're killing each other, then they retreat. 
and Israel is able to go on and, and ca catch up with them and defeat them completely. We'll talk more about that next week. But these fruits of wisdom, the fact that when we are in a position of accepting God's wisdom, we are ready and, and able to accept his divine direction. The fact that when we are following his divine direction, he is gracious enough to provide for us the second fruit, which is faithful fellowship. The fact that through his wisdom, he gives us a proper perspective that it is him that is the provider of the sort and the resource for all that we need in whatever battle we're facing. The fact that the, the fruit of wisdom, when God's people are accepting God's wisdom, there is popular participation. In other words, they join together to do what God wants them to do, even if it doesn't make perfect sense to them. And then the fifth fruit, valiant victory because of who God is and what he does to prove, to prove himself to his people and to those who are not his people so that they may know that he is the one true God. We, we could easily um, do this tonight and look around and say, okay, we've only got a few here, uh, a few people here, um, and uh, we, we could say, you know what? Um, it's not enough. It's not enough to, to do God's work, but we'd be wrong. We could say that um, whatever man's wisdom might dictate in our situation, maybe in your personal situation, our situation as a church. And we could say, you know, it just doesn't look like there's any fruit to be gained here. Most of the time when we say that, though, we're looking for the wrong fruit in the wrong places. And what God wants us to do is to, is to look to his wisdom and receive that divine direction. Um, rejoice and count on and embrace faithful fellowship to have a proper perspective to um, joyfully and pot in as a group participate and to to recognize to trust in and recognize and give him praise for the victories that he gives us let me pray with y'all but we thank you that the the fruit of your wisdom is plentiful just as your wisdom is to us. Thank you that you are available and therefore your wisdom is available to us. And I pray that you would help us to be available to you, um, that you would help us to know you, uh, surrender and submit to your wisdom and um, have a perspective in our hearts and minds that resonates with, resonates by saying, um, God is my resource for all things. I pray that you would deliver us from the limitations that each one of us have and being afraid of those. I, for, I pray that you would help us to be free of the limitations that we, that we see in others or um, in your church here. I pray that you would help us to have a perspective that says, yes, we are limited. And therefore, we must trust in God, um, who is unlimited. I thank you for giving us that opportunity and putting us in situations, in our situation, to, um, to depend on you. Please help us do so. And uh, we thank you for it. And ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.